We have two bills and a presentation on the agenda. Um, and we're going to start with Senator Wickland's House File 150. Welcome to the committee on the other side of the table. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is and it, good morning. Is the microphone uh, on? I'm not sure. Yeah, the microphone. Is it on or? Hang on a second. Everything on. Can you hear me? Blow into the mic and see if it's. Yeah, now it's like on. Okay. Right. Good. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm here today to talk about House File uh, 150. Um, this is a bill that would provide some short-term funding in an area that we know is really um, an area in crisis in Minnesota. Um, for child care uh, providers child care and families, um, there's a, a lack of, of ability to find affordable, uh, high-quality child care. There's also um, the issue that providers today are compensated at extremely low levels um, and we need to be doing a lot more this session. This bill is really to address needs um, on a short-term basis and provides funding for two programs. Uh, one is the stabilization grants program that had, had been uh, put in place um, in 2021. Uh, using federal money uh, and has um, been very successful at providing uh, monthly payments to providers of all kinds um, over the last, um, last year and a half, two years. And then the second part of the bill is to provide uh, funding for early learning scholarships and that would provide a uh, a short-term um, infusion of additional funding for early learning scholarships, and this would enable more families to access um, scholarships right away. Um, both of these would be uh, fiscal year uh, 2023 funding. So um, the stabilization grant uh, program has been very uh, successful at helping both family child care providers and center-based child care providers. It helps them supplement their compensation and has assisted in keeping programs open. But the grants are scheduled to be reduced significantly in March and will end um, at the end of June of 2023. This bill would allow providers to receive an amount closer to the current monthly amount through June rather than seeing it decrease after March. Um, this funding is essential given the continuation of other stresses that are facing child care providers. There's low compensation for staff in a job market where higher wages are much more easily found right now. Um, there's the challenge that providers, um, center providers face in retaining workers and they really can't um, afford to raise the, the um, the rates that they charge families because families simply cannot afford to pay more. Uh, families are already paying um, uh, extremely high amounts. Uh, the percentage of their income is, you know, well over 10, 20 percent. Um, so they really cannot raise rates to cover um, raising the compensation for providers. So during the period from September 2021 through June of 2022, on average, over 29,000 child care workers received this additional compensation each month. The current monthly payment is about $400. Um, the additional funding for early learning scholarships would allow more families to access child care providers of their choice, and this is a one-time appropriation. Uh, both of these expenditures would utilize funding from this fiscal year to help families and providers immediately. I think in your uh, materials today you have some um, information from a couple, well, I'm not sure if you have it. I know, I believe that uh, posted online are several letters of support uh, for the learning, early learning scholarships um, because of the, uh, the amount that would be um, included the $40 million, that um, immediate investment would be used to provide a, approximately 4,000 scholarships. The average amount of the scholarships right now is about $10,000. Um, and I'm 
I'm certainly open to answering any questions. If you have more questions about the stabilization <coughs> grant program or the early learning scholarships. Thank you, Senator Wicklund, and with the 40 million to be able to say it's exactly 4,000 kids if it's about 10,000 each, it helps. They're both one-time appropriations, um, um, and I, I'm hearing both myself and from colleagues about who are hearing from child care providers who are very stressed out and eager for this. Um, Mr. Nauman, did you want to comment on the funding at both one-time things? So, Mr. Chair and members, uh, as has already been testified, I'll just keep this very short. Uh, there are two appropriations in the bill, both from the general fund, both in fiscal year 2023. They're both uh, indicated as one-time, so 12.25 um, for child care stabilization grants and then the early learning scholarships at $40 million a year. All right. $40 million one time. <laughs> Difference there. Is there questions from the committee? Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and could you tell me where this uh, bill is referred to after this stop? Uh, I believe this bill goes to the floor next. This is generally the last stop. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Mr. Senator Has Dames. this bill been sent to the E-12 finance? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, yes. Thank it, you. it went through um, Health and Human Services, my committee, and then because of the stabilization grant funding, that's my jurisdiction, and then it went to Education Finance, and we heard, and I presented it in Senator Kunesh's committee. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Senator Dames, good question, but yeah, when we have the House file in front of us, we don't always see what committees it's been to. Further discussion? Senator Murphy. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Senator Marty, and I, uh, I just I just want to thank you, Senator Wickland, for the work on this. It is so abundantly clear that we need to do urgent work uh, on child care. Uh, you and I were on Human Services Committee together in the last term where we heard a lot about this, and I know it is an issue for families and communities and employers and workers all across the state of Minnesota, and it's felt somewhat elusive and out of reach. Um, while we've known the problem, we haven't really put the time and energy into finding a meaningful solution. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that this is something you've been working on for a long time, so it is great uh, to be here and in this committee to see the fruit of that work and the potential for relief for Minnesotans. So I just want to make sure and put on the record how important I think this is and how grateful I am that you've brought it. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Dreheim, did you have Thank you. Um, I love the concept. Obviously, child care is one of those things that I, I think that uh, we need to do a better job on. So thank you for bringing this bill forward. Um, it, my question is more procedural. I, on the, um, you know, kind of building on Senator Deems' question, when I look up the House file, it, it shows that they received it from the, um, the House on the 16th. Um, and that was referred to finance on the 16th, but it doesn't show it going to education. So I'm just curious why. It Senator Dreheim, in that you'd have to look at the Senate File 53, Chair, yeah, which Senate is File her 53. bill. In other words, it, it went through the, if you look at Senate File 53, you can see the committees it was referred to and that referred to <coughs> finance. And that's, here's when the, the House file crossed over and so it's substituted here. And if we had, if she was working off the Senate language, um, we would be having both bills in the file. So we would pass out House File 150 with whatever language we choose to pass out. But um, I believe the difference between House and Senate so language was largely technical. Yeah. So, so um, Senator Dreheim, I, I understand the confusion, but if you have to look at Senate File 53. Um, to find out what committees, and it went through Health and Human Services on um, the, 9th. the 9th of January, and then... I think, I think there's a typo, Chair, on, uh, on two two of the log in the Senate. Uh, if you click on, I'm being informed that page 582, it will actually say that it was education finance, so thank oh, you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, but wherever the glitch was, we should make sure it's corrected. Is there further discussion? Senator Dames. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Wickland. Just a question for you. Rural Minnesota, we have a lot of uh, uh, child care providers that uh, uh, we may have uh, somebody that provides child care for five, six children. Uh, 
Is any of the money that's being appropriated here going to get down to that level? Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, um, yes, for sure, the, uh, the uh, stabilization grants, um, providers can apply for those. It's very brief, um, pretty simple application process that they put in their information and then they receive the monthly um, grants. And um, let's see, I, I probably have the breakdown with the number of family child care providers here somewhere, but um, there is a report that the department did on the first year of the stabilization grant program. And um, in terms of uh, licensed family provider participation, um, in year one, ab about 70, well, a little less than 70% of the licensed family providers had participated in this, this study. So, I mean, it is getting out there to a significant number of family child care providers. Um, not all of them participate, but uh, DHS has done, has done quite a bit of outreach to make sure that people know about the program and that they're aware that it's not, um, there aren't other um, constraints on the application process for that. Follow up, Mr. Chair. And how many dollars was that, the total, for, for the grants? Uh, the total that we are putting into it from the federal funding is, um, I can find that amount. The, the monthly amount that providers receive at this point is about $400 per month, per. the grant, per, per provider. And it's meant to go towards compensation. That's why it's per provider. It's meant to go to that person that's doing the work. And so family child care providers or center care workers are, are receiving up $400 per month. A follow up, Mr. Chair. The 40 million early learning scholarships, does any of that go to those folks? Yes. Um, Oh, Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, yes, the, the scholarships are utilized by children statewide, um, and there's a process that w through uh, the Department of Education um, that allocates the scholarships, and um, families, basically, they, they have to submit applications, and they get support, and then they can take the um, scholarship to a, pro a program of their choice. And they can be used um, in any program that has been rated under the parent aware system. So it's home based child care, center based child care, Head Start, or school based programs. So, yes, family child care providers can participate in the scholarship program as well. well thank you, Senator. I appreciate it. It reported it wrong, I'm sorry. And um, is there further discussion? If not, Senator Wicklin moves Senate file, House File 150 um, be recommended pass. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Wicklin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, we're going to... <laughs> Frustrated because I, I hear we may lose Assistant Commissioner Hassemer very quickly, but Senator Swazinski's got a bill up in just a minute. I'm told another committee is so okay. So we're going to try and do his real quickly, and I don't know. You may have to go. I hope not, but we'll we'll, we'll be as fast as we can. Okay. Um, So, maybe we should. <clears throat> what? Yep, she has to be there at 10. I. I kind of feel we should just go ahead with the... Here oh, here they come. Okay. Senator Swazinski, real quickly. Senate file 1090. 
trying to move quickly because the next presentation uh, presenters has to leave in a few minutes. So, Senate File 1090 um, is before us. Uh, can you quickly explain the bill? Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Chair and members. Now I know how a ping pong ball feels. Um, so this bill is fairly complicated and controversial. Every seven or ten years, I don't even remember, I know it's ten years now, but when I was still teaching, every seven years, every department ha was in their year in the bubble or the barrel or the babble. I don't even remember what it was called. But because of COVID, it complicated the curriculum cycles and the revision and re um, um, cycles for the st adopting standards. And FIAD took a particularly hard hit and implementation um, now not is, is going to be um, happening at the same time as revising the standards. So it's hard to implement the standards while you're revising the standards. And um, this should probably be before the Finance Committee because it's going to save $40,000. And so I don't know how often you guys get to hear things like that. And I have Mr. Uni up here from the department uh, um, to help me if any questions you guys raise um, are too complicated for me. So... And, and, um, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members. Senator Swazinski, over the four-year period, it's because it's a delay, we're going to be paying for it later. But um, right. Mr. Nauman, can you quickly do the fiscal note? Yes, Mr. Chair and members, there's a general fund savings of $40,000 that the, uh, the department has identified. There is no reduction to the agency department in the uh, agency appropriation in the bill. Um, this would occur in uh, fiscal 23. Um, there would be an increased uh, liability for the agency in fiscal 27 of the same amount. So it's just pushing the $40,000 cost associated with the standards from one fiscal year into, to another. There is discussion on the bill. If not, Senator Champion moves that Senate File 1090 be recommended to pass. So moved. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Um, welcome to the committee, MMB folks. Um, presentation on stadium financing. And um, we appreciate your coming here to explain stadium financing situation and um, stadium reserve. And I'm not sure, Assistant Commissioner, if you want to begin or Mr. Dahl. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll kick it off here today. Um, and we've got plenty of time before I need to head out in about an hour. So. Oh, okay. We yep. were told first you had till 10, and then we were told you had to be somewhere further away at 10, and you had to leave now. So I apologize. Anyway, Apology. thank you for the flexibility this morning. Um, for the record, Mr. Chair, I'm Jennifer Hassamer. I'm Assistant Commissioner for Debt Management at Minnesota Management and Budget. And here with me today is Brian Dahl, Financial Planning Director at MNB. Um, so first of all, thank you for inviting us to come speak about the stadium finance law today. What I will highlight for you from the outset is that we are intending to focus on the state of the current law that was passed in 2012 and the various financing arrangements that were passed in that. At the very end, we will highlight, briefly highlight the governor's budget recommendation in regards to the stadium and the stadium reserve. Um, but what we'll start with today is by giving an overview of the timeline of how we got to where we are today. We'll walk through the aspects of the stadium construction financing, and then Brian will walk through some of the aspects about the ongoing um, operating and capital maintenance accounts at the stadium, as long as the stadium reserve. So if we flip to the first slide, what we see here is a timeline um, of how we got to where we are today, and it all started with the passage of the stadium finance law in 2012. Um, that authorized the public financing for the construction of a new stadium, as well as uh, providing for the ongoing operations and maintenance um, caretaking there. At the very end of 2013, construction uh, started on the stadium, and the state sold bonds in early 2014 to finance the public construction costs for the stadium. This was all very carefully negotiated between all of the parties back in 2012 between the legislature, the state, the city of Minneapolis, and the Vikings. 
construction, if you skip ahead, two things happened in 2016. At the very beginning of the calendar year, the state began withholding payments and contributing to the operating and capital reserve accounts held by the Minnesota Sports Facilities Authority. And then construction finished on the stadium that summer just in time for the opening of the professional football season that year. Fast forward again to 2020, and by that time, the state and the city of Minneapolis had finalized negotiations around the agreement for the retention of local sales taxes uh, used to support the city's contributions towards the stadium. And in January 2021, the state began retaining the city sales taxes for the purposes specified in the law. And I'll just briefly uh, highlight here, just in case anyone does not, uh, is not familiar with the mechanism by which the state retains those sales taxes. Um, those are centrally collected by the State Department of Revenue before the balance that is owed to the city is remitted to them on a monthly basis. Now we're about 10 years past the passage of that stadium finance law. And later this summer, the state has its first opportunity to either refinance or repay the existing debt that the state issued for the stadium. And for those of you that have been following the forecast, um, you know that the stadium reserve account has been growing considerably over time. And under current projections in fiscal 24, there is now expected to be a sufficient balance in the stadium reserve that could prepay the remaining outstanding debt uh, on the stadium. But things don't end there, and you can see the long timeline that still exists before us under the existing uh, debt financing schedule. Those bonds are scheduled uh, to mature, have their final maturity in 2043, unless we do anything differently this year. And then under current law, uh, the retention of city sales taxes under, under current statute is scheduled to uh, exist until 20, the end of 2046. So on the next slide, um, what you can kind of surmise already, uh, this was a complicated law, and it was comprehensive in scope. It covered everything from the construction of the stadium, the financing for it, as well as the ongoing operations and maintenance uh, obligations for the, the, uh, the stadium. Uh, on the next, we'll walk through each of these buckets on the, on the coming slides. We'll give you some more details here. Um, and starting with the construction, uh, this was a true public-private partnership. Uh, the final price tag of the construction was over $1 billion, with the public share of construction costs being about 45% of that total cost, and the private share representing about 55% of that total cost. The 2012 law uh, specified that the state's contribution towards construction costs was not to exceed $348 million, and that the city's share of construction costs was not to exceed $150 million. That equates to a public, uh, public share split of roughly 70-30 between the state and the city. And the state issued bonds in 2014 to cover the full cost of those construction, the public share of the construction costs. And on the next slide, we give you just a few facts about that debt financing. Of course, in 2013 and 2014, when the construction was getting underway, um, neither the state nor the city had sufficient cash uh, sitting around and available to fully pay for the public share of the construction costs. So it was very typical for other capital assets around the state, there was a debt financing involved to provide those funds. Additionally, city convention center taxes were not expected to become available until 2021 to start covering the city's share of the stadium costs. So in January of 2014, MMB issued $462 million of bonds uh, to cover the state and the city share of construction costs. Those bonds had an aggregate price tag of $882 million, carried an interest rate of 4.25%, and were going to mature over a 30-year period, which matches up with the Vikings' current lease on the stadium. MMB began paying debt service on those bonds in 2014. The annual debt service payments every year have exceeded just over $30 million. And currently today, we still have $388 million of those bonds outstanding. We have one payment coming up in June, and after that time, there will be $377 million of bonds that we will have an opportunity to either pay off or refinance later this year. And we will cover some more of those details in the coming slides. So with the chair's permission, I will now hand it over to Brian Dahl um, to continue with the finance, other financial arrangements for the stadium. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Dahl. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, moving on to this next slide, this slide shows the second and third components of stadium finance, the operating and maintenance of the facility itself. The city and the Vikings contribute to these two uses. With the, Viking, the Vikings began contributing 8.5 million for operating and 1.5 million to the stadium capital reserve for maintenance starting in 2016. These payments for the Vikings inflate annually by statute at 3% per year. As we move over to the right side of the slide and the green boxes representing city obligations for capital and maintenance, we first want to point out how the city makes contributions for stadium obligations. <coughs> All city payments for operating and maintenance as well as the city's payments for construction obligations are remitted via state retention of the city hospitality tax revenue. And then the state makes it payments on the city's behalf. The city has three obligations for operating and capital maintenance. Six million dollars for operating, inflated annually at the rate of growth of the city's sales tax base. This obligation started in 2016. 1.5 million for capital reserve contributions, also inflated at the sales tax base rate of growth, and also started in 2016. For both of these obligations, from 2016 through 2020, the state made payments on the city's behalf without retaining a like amount of sales tax revenue in those years. The last city operating and maintenance payment is based on a formula that captures a portion of the annual growth in the sales tax base and allocates it to the MSFA, the Stadium Facilities Authority. This payment does not have a defined use in law, but the MSFA has indicated that funds have been used for maintenance and capital needs at the facility. Moving to the next slide, this slide lays out total city obligations. Moving from left to right, it shows the projected annual cost to the city this chart uses fiscal year 24 as the sample year. The aggregate cost of the given line item from inception through fiscal year 2047 when city obligations end. And the amount to be recaptured back, the, the amount expected to be recaptured back by the end of this current state fiscal year. The first line item labeled construction represents the amount the state and city negotiated to be retained annually from 2021 through 2046. This amount is based on the net present value of $150 million, the city's statutory construction obligation, discounted at 4.25% and spread into level payments from 2021 through 2046. This amount is retained annually by the state from city sales tax, and the aggregate value of this payment is $333 million by the end of the, this fiscal year the state will have retained 32 million of that total. The next line shows the city's payback to the state for payments the state made for operating capital reserve payments from 2016 through 2020 on the city's behalf. In those five years, the state did not retain city revenue to fund these payments. The state and city negotiated a retention schedule of a level annual payments of two and a half million dollars per year from 2021 through 2046. And the aggregate value of these payments over that time is $66 million. And by the end of this year, $6.4 million will have been retained. The next two lines represent the city's current year payments for operating and capital reserve and, and the retained amounts for excess growth formula payments to MSFA. The state retains these revenues and then makes payments to MSFA in like amounts each year. In fiscal 24, payments for operating and capital reserve will be 9.6 million, and the aggregate, aggregate total for the city is expected to be to sum to 333 million when they end in 2046. In fiscal 24, the excess growth formula allocation is expected to be 1.8 million, and is estimated to sum to an aggregate total of 123 million when they end. However, this formula is highly volatile. It's based on the growth, future growth of sales tax to the city. So it's very uncertain how large these will get in the future. Moving to the next slide. This slide focuses in on the city's repayment to the state 
for payments the state covered for the city. The first construction obligation shows the aggregated value of the negotiated payment schedule for the city's $150 million share of construction costs. Under the repayment schedule, the aggregate value of this repayment will be $333 million, and the city will have repaid $32 million by the end of this fiscal year. And the second shows, again, the repayment for the state advances, totaling $39.5 million from 2016 for, through 2020 for city obligation for operating and capital reserve payments. In aggregate, this repayment will total Excuse 60. Excuse me, Mr. Dowell, for a second. Senator Champion, go ahead. Just one quick question. If you go back to your slide number seven, um, even though you talked about the volatility of the excess growth allocation, if, 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 if the annual cost, based on what you have here, is $1.8 million, and, and, and so you're saying that the aggregate cost of that is going to be over the life of, of, of that notion will be 123 million. Is that what we're saying? And then, um, well, first of all, that's what I see here, right? Uh, Mr. Know. Chair, Senator, that's correct. And, but this number could be higher. Mr. Chair, Chair, Senator, that's correct. If you'd like, I could walk through the assumptions we have to generate that aggregate number. That would be good maybe after you yep. go through yep. this, if that's okay. Let's but finish I the presentation, but let's get back to that then. Yes, yes, okay. If we go back to that later, yes. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Doe. <clears throat> so moving on to the next slide, um, titled State Stadium Finance and Revenue, uh, we're now going to switch to uh, state per perspective on stadium finance. This slide shows revenues collected by the state Mr. related. Dell, I don't know if you got to on the bottom of page eight, your slide eight, the payback of the 2016-2020 advances. Did you? Thanks, Mr. Over? Chair. I apologize if I, I wasn't sure if I had gotten through that entire okay. slide. Go ahead. Resume. That. So, um, Mr. Chair, the the bottom of that slide uh, shows the state repayment for state advances totaling $39.5 million from 2016 through 20 for the city obligations for operating and capital reserve payments to the MSFA. In aggregate, this repayment will total $66.1 million between 2021 and 2046, and to date $6.4 million has been retained by the end of this fiscal year, excuse me. And Mr. Dahl, that is in effect the fact that the state did not hold the sales taxes that they were, that was, the city was going to be responsible for it, so the state would have held the sales taxes, but because they need the sales tax revenue for other things, it was not withheld, and that the, the value of that $39.5 million that we held over the first four or five years, um, that will cost $66 million to pay back, and they've so far paid back six point four. Is that what that one is saying? Mr. Chair, that's correct. And the, the reason for the difference is um, interest payments over time. Um, and it, again, just to be clear, uh, based on the 2012 legislation, city payments were not scheduled right. to start until 2021. Thank you. Please continue. So now moving on to the, last, to the next slide, um, we're switching to a state view of stadium finance obligations. Mr. Chair. Go ahead, I just Chair. want to make sure that he said something. I want to make sure that we underscore because you were asking about the construction obligation and that the city's obligation did not start, uh, uh, wouldn't start until later. But during this period of time, you were still taking that uh, future gross, gross tax, right? That, that excess growth allocation. That was still being recovered by the state. Is that right? Mr. Chair, Mr. Senator, that is correct. The, that last line, the city excess sales tax allocation, I'll move to the slide so we can see it. Number page seven. Yep. Mm -hmm. That payment began being retained in 2013. That is the only city uh, obligation under the stadium law that started before 2021. So I just wanted that clear because when he says that the, that the state was making these payments and the city wasn't paying anything, that is misleading because the city was paying something that was being captured. And I so, just want us to underscore that. And just, just, Senator Champion, just so I understand, in effect, of the sales tax, after 2020, the state was going to be 
retaining all Minneapolis' sales tax for paying the city's portion, but as Senator Champion, you're pointing out that if the sales tax base grew by grew by a $5 million or whatever, then the state would collect that we'd be retaining. In other words, the city didn't pay, we didn't retain the sales tax portion they were collecting at the time, but the growth in the sales tax we were taking, is that correct, Mr. Dell? Mr. Chair, it's mostly correct. The one amendment I would make to it is that it's a portion of the growth. The formula grabs, in effect, a portion of the growth. Okay. The city keeps portion of it, and a portion of the growth is allocated to the MSFA. Good. And just so that you're clear, Mr. <coughs> Chair, is that even though there was that construction um, uh, obligation and there's also the, uh, the operating obligation uh, that uh, that's necessary the state would be getting over and above what they need to pay for the uh, cost directly related to the st to the stadium for operating and maintenance because they're getting this other line of the uh, the excess growth allocation which is based on uh, this formula as well as far as the growth so I just want us to be clear that even if the city wants to start paying this obligation they have to pay both the construction based on this uh, paid seven. Also, they have to pay the operating um, uh, costs and maintenance costs. And then if there's any growth growth in their in our tax revenues or whatever, right, or or, or, or or whatever, there would be additional money on top of it all that they have to pay over and beyond anyone else, not even just the Vikings or any, or, or anyone. That's my understanding. Am I making myself clear or am I confusing you more, Mr. Chair? Um, Senator Champion, I think that was helpful. <laughs> so I want to be helpful. That's what I understand. So I just want us to be clear that we're talking construction, operating, and maintenance. And then if there's any other growth, the state then takes a, a portion of that as well. Sure. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Champion. And thank you, Mr. Dahl. This growth is only when there is a growth in sales tax and only a percentage of that growth in those years where it shows growth. Is that right? Mr. Chair, so, Senator, that's correct. It's a portion of the growth. Thank you. Um, for instance, during the pandemic when the city saw negative growth in sales tax, zero dollars from this formula were allocated to the MSFA. In our most recent forecast, growth has uh, accelerated and payments have um, increased relative to prior estimates. This next year is expected to be $1.8 million. Thank you. And, and just, Mr. Senator Chair. Champion, go ahead. Just so we're clear is that that growth, uh, with your McAllister degree, uh, I mean, I guess you understood that growth doesn't mean, you know, anything else. But what I'm saying is that even with that growth, um, that's for operating and maintenance costs and still doesn't go to or towards any of the bonds or any or anything else to accelerate those payments because they already the city already has an obligation under uh, this agreement to to do operating and maintenance costs. You just now to capture their growth and then there's some other things that you 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 are paying in that context over and above what they're already required to pay. I believe you are correct. That's all I'm trying to tell you. I have one more Senator quick question on the growth of the sales tax. None of the growth of the sales tax is from businesses in the stadium, right? They're all tax, sales tax exempt under the agreement? Is that, Mr. Dow, do you know that? Mr. Chair, to be honest, I think we'll have to check on that and get okay. back to you. I'm not sure. Um, certainly the Department of Revenue could speak to that question, but I don't think. I'd be, I'd be curious because I don't think they're paying any sales tax or, or property tax, obviously. They're not paying either, but. M Mr. Chair, what I know for certain is the construction materials on the stadium right, itself were, were exempted, exempted from right. sales tax. Okay, I think the proceeds of businesses in there may be exempt as well. Senator Dames, and then we'll get back to the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Dahl, would it be fair to say that Minneapolis is paying uh, their obligations uh, on a profit and on a timely basis? Mr. Chair, Senator, yes, Minneapolis has remitted all their payments based on the statute and the negotiated agreement with the city under that statute on time. Anything else? If not, Mr. Dahl, please continue. 
Okay, Mr. Chair, moving on to um, the state side of stadium finance. This slide shows revenues collected by the state related to the stadium financing framework. Some of these revenues we've already talked about, so you'll see them again, but the formula is somewhat complex in that the city revenues end up in the general fund and then payments are made out of the general fund on the city's behalf, so you'll see them again. Each of these revenues, like I just said, are deposited in the state general fund. The first, the amounts from lawful gambling tax, defined as total gambling tax receipts above 36.9 million, which was the forecast amount at the time of the stadium uh, bill passing. Electronic and paper tax receipts allocated to fund stadium obligations with any remainder deposited into the stadium reserve. 159 million in lawful gambling tax revenue was available for stadium obligations in this current fiscal year. And that's expected to grow under the current forecast to $197 million in fiscal year 27. The second, city hospitality taxes are also deposited into the general fund. This is expected to total almost $27 million next fiscal year. These revenues will be retained through 2046. Of those amounts, $12.8 million is for the city's construction obligation. $9.6 million is for the city's capital and operating maintenance obligation. $2.5 million is for payback from those 2016 through 20 advances for the city's operating and capital maintenance obligations. And then finally, the excess growth payment that we were referring to earlier. Moving to the next slide, this is a look at state spending related to the stadium. Each of these items are general fund appropriations, starting at the top left and working clockwise. 9.6 million for the state's, state, city's operating and capital reserve obligation. Again, that's equal to the amount of retained sales tax revenue. 1% of gambling tax revenue for problem gambling programs at the Department of Human Services. 30.1 million for debt service to cover the entire public share that covers state and city debt service. And then 2.7 million payment for St. Paul Sports Facilities grants. Senator Murphy. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I appreciate um, the pause. And I'm just um, wanting to know, Mr. Chair, if we could go back to slide nine. And if Mr. Dahl could just explain for me one more time so I'm clear why there are things included in the stadium reserve formula and why there are things that are excluded from that formula on this slide and in practice, please. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, um, my first most clear answer would be that's what the law says. Um, frankly, some of these I haven't been sure why they were excluded from the reserve formula. What I will say is that um, the first one is repayment from a loan the state in advance the state made for the city. And the second one is simply money in, money out in a given year. Please proceed. So moving on to the next slide, this slide shows a picture of our stadium reserve calculation. So after all of the revenues related to the stadium and all of the spending related to the stadium come in through the general fund, MMB is then directed to calculate based on this formula the difference between the two and then allocate that difference into the stadium reserve account, which is within the general fund. So th to be clear, that's taking lawful gambling tax revenue, the city's hospitality sales tax revenue, and then subtracting the expenses debt service city obligations for operating and capital reserve, the sports facilities grants to the city of St. Paul, and then the problem gambling appropriations. And the difference is then held off of the general fund bottom line and deposited into the stadium reserve each fiscal year. In statute, stadium reserve, statute governs stadium reserve uses. The first use is if there's any shortfall in city sales tax revenue. Um, as we discussed earlier, the state retains city sales tax revenue, so it's unlikely that there would be a shortfall in any given year. 
The second is stadium-related uses, including capital and operating costs, refundings, and prepayment of debt that are authorized to be uh, spent by the Commissioner of Management and Budget after consultation with the Legislative Commission on planning and fiscal policy. This next slide shows a graphical representation of the stadium reserve based on the February 2023 forecast. The reserve balance is expected to be $366.2 million by the end of this fiscal year. The balance is represented by the green line. Expenses related to the stadium is represented by the blue line. As Assistant Commissioner Hasmer mentioned earlier, bond payoff on June 1st of this year is, is expected to be $377 million. Uh, if we paid off bonds on June 1st this year, it would result in $226 million in savings from eliminated future interest costs. Paying off the debt, however, would not cancel the city's obligation to pay its share of construction costs, which runs through 2046 under current law. To be clear, forgiving the law, changing the law and forgiving the city's construction obligation would cost the state $12.8 million per year under the current forecast. Just to be clear, that's about With that, Mr. Chair, I can move on to summarizing the governor's recommendation related to the stadium. So, Senator Champion first. Go ahead. Just one question. So uh, if, if the debt was paid off or the bonds are paid off um, based on the amount of money available in the stadium reserves, Paying off the debt would not cancel the city's obligation to pay their share of construction costs. I got that. But under the current law, would it still obligate the city to pay uh, any portion of their excess growth allocation? Mr. Chair, Senator, unless the law were changed, the city would still be obligated to make the excess growth formula payments um, in each year through 2046. So it probably, Mr. Chair, would be helpful even on your slide if you say stadium financing and bond payoff to even make, make that clear because what seems to be happening, in my opinion, as we have these discussions, no one really talks about that excess uh, growth allocation because that is, a, that is money that is money that's being paid by residents of the city of Minneapolis, or others who might come because it's hospitality, I get that part, right? And so I just want, want to make sure that we, we don't lose sight of that. So thank you. Senator Westrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to your, one of your last comments, uh, the $12.8 million it would cost the state if we paid it off. Um, I'm going to ask you for a little more clarification, but let me just uh, reaffirm reaffirm what I think I heard you say. Uh, if the state would pay the debt off, the idea would be to save the interest, uh, future interest costs for the state. Would the, would the city, and is the city now just paying the state its portion anyways, so the city would continue paying back the, their share, which might be $100 million of the 377 or whatever number it is, and so the state would be made whole, we would just in essence, be borrowing the city money uh, at the same rate of interest and paying our debt off and just, and just um, saving, saving the state taxpayers that interest payment. But then what, where I have a disconnect is the $12.8 million. Where would, why would it cost the state that $12.8 million? Or are you proposing a possible change and the state's going to pay the $12.8 million now if we pay it off and then relieve the city of, of some ob future obligations. If you could clarify that, that would be helpful. 
Sure, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator, I'll kick it off and then maybe Brian can handle the second part of the question that you just asked about the cost to the state. Um, it is true that paying off the debt this summer, uh, if we can do that in full, just takes the debt financing out of the picture. It does not change any of the current law regarding the city's obligations to pay their share of the construction costs. So it saves taxpayers on the interest cost for the remaining 20 years of the debt that we would be saving about the 226 million dollars. But because the city is on a repayment schedule um, over another 23 years, there is still going to be an ongoing cost that the city will be, that the state will be retaining those taxes over that period of time in order to make up the cost until the city has paid their full constru construction share under current law. And Brian, I don't know if you want to handle the second part. Sure. Mr. Chair, Senator, to the point of 12 million, $12.8 million cost to the state, that cost would not materialize just by paying off the stadium debt early. That cost would only materialize if the law was changed to forgive the city's construction obligation. So under current law, the state retains $12.8 million from the city each year. And if that for, we, we were to forgive that revenue, that repayment, the state would, that would cost the state that $12.8 million per year. And Mr. Chair, um, the, the $12.8 million, is that with interest uh, included? So that's the, that's the amortized cost to the city at the rate of interest the bonds are. And if they keep paying it back, the state would be getting interest, a similar interest uh, on, on, on its money as well. Mr. Mr. Chair, Senator, that's correct. The state is potentially losing out on investment earnings by using state resources this year to pay off the bonds in full. So there would be an ongoing interest cost to the city for, for repaying that debt over an additional 23 years. Okay, and last uh, question, Mr. Chair. Uh, so why, why are we talking about the 12.8 million? Is there a proposal and maybe you're getting into that? Uh, or... Uh, Nothing, nothing needs to change if we pay it off. We, we just keep getting that payment in and the state just relieves its books of some of the debt. But why are, why are we talking about it otherwise? Is there, I, I maybe haven't been in the loop on some of this, but um, if that's current law, why, why are we talking about it now? Senator Westrom, I think the, 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 reason, it's, the reason it's being talked about is because it's, we're just trying to spell out today where all the money is coming from, where it's going from, what it's for, et cetera. In other words, it, it, I guess my question related to that was the state's paying off, presumably could pay off the bonds beginning in June. Um, if Minneapolis were to pay off its share, how much would it cost? If they present value, how much would they have to pay now in order to avoid the interest in ongoing payments? What would that be? Mr. Chair, we don't have that calculation, but it would safe, be safe to say it would be a hundred, hundreds of millions of dollars still. I thought their total obligation was 150 million. And some of that's paid off, isn't it? Go ahead. Whoever. Uh, Mr. Chair, if you think back, I think it was slide seven perhaps. Um, and I know we've looked at it before. Uh, yeah, I guess eight, Brian. The, the bar chart. So if you look at that top bar graph, um, the city's current obligation to repay the $150 million construction cost over, over time is that $333 million aggregate cost. Um, so they are not paying back just the $150 million. It's being essentially financed over time. Right, but, but um, Assistant Commissioner, what I'm asking is if they were to pay it off in cash now, mm -hmm. It's less than 150 million because they paid some of it off. They don't have to pay interest if they're paying it now. Mr. That's Chair, I'm trying to get the number. How much is that, just roughly speaking? How much do they owe? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I understand the question, and this is where this financing law gets very complicated. Um, if you recall, the state began making payments uh, almost 10 years ago at this point at the higher interest rate, the four and a quarter percent. So the state has already made um, significant payments on behalf of the city. So any type of calculation about what it would cost to pay back the city's share would need to factor in the prior 10 years that the state has been covering their obligation. So it would it could be calculated, but it would take some time to calculate. Okay. So in other words, but, but the simple answer is it could be more than 150 because the state covered their costs earlier. So 150 was the principal, 
But since we were paying interest on it for the first few years, it could be more than that. Senator Champion, on that or? Uh, ahead, yes, Jamie. on this issue. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, Commissioner, then what that would also mean is I think you should give us some information and, not, and, and, and that information should be not calculating in, because you can give us two numbers, not calculating in what the state paid or anything like that, but if it was just like you were buying a car and you had a loan or a house and you say, what is today's payoff? That's what we want to know. Yeah. You do not have to calculate in, although you can separately from my understanding, but you are much smarter about these things than I am. From my understanding, that you can give us two numbers then. One number is if we were just to pay it off right now today, what would that number be? What is the payoff? Then if you want to give us a separate number to say, hey, by the way, the state has been paying this up to this particular point, and there's a, a, a requirement or, or at least a discussion should be made about the past revenue that has been paid. So per, perhaps I'm missing it, and I see Mr. Norman giving me that glare of, <laughs> uh, of what most finance people will do, but I think that can be done. And it, it is true that, that Mr. Norman and I go to the same barber, so we have the same thoughts. <laughs> I never heard that one before. <laughs> He used it on me the other day, okay. uh, Mr. Chair, at my town hall meeting. Good. Mr. Nauman, do you have any comments on, on either barbers or? It's probably safest for me to just sit on the sidelines. <laughs> um, but I, I, I hope MMB could. I, I think um, if, yeah. if I take out a car loan and then and I'm, the initial interest payments are you don't pay no, no interest payments until 2021 or whatever. Um, the debt may be significantly higher at that point. But in any case, I, I think it would be helpful to everyone if MMB could calculate what the present value of Minneapolis debt on that would be. Um, on well, whatever, Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before we move on to, um, to the last, the governor's proposal on, on number 13, I had to step off for a minute, so I apologize if this was already covered. But um, just... I'm assuming that the proposal, because the stadium reserve amount is projected to increase so much, that we are able to pay off this debt using the stadium reserve money. So we don't actually have to use any other sources of funds, except I think you mentioned something about $12 million or something. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, if it would help, I could Sp take a minute or two and just walk through the governor's proposal, and I think it would okay, um, great. Thank you. answer that question. So the next two slides summarize the governor's proposal. The governor's proposal is in several parts. Um, the first of which, as we've covered, is paying off the construction debt on the stadium. This would cost the state $377 million. Based on current projections, the stadium reserve balance at that time is projected to be about 366 million. So to pay off the reserve, pay off the debt on that date, it would take an additional general fund allocation of $10.8 million. The next component is forgiving the Minneapolis repayment of the 2016 through 20 operating and capital reserve payment. That's the two and a half million dollars per year payment. And between 2024 and 2046, this would cost the state $59.7 million and save the city that same amount. The next piece is fund phase one of the construction of a perimeter fence around the stadium, costing $15.7 million. And finally, repealing the stadium reserve. And if we go to the next slide, we can see the general fund impact of this proposal because it's, there's many parts. The first three lines are the expenses, paying off the bonds, paying for the security fence, and forgiving the loan payment. The next line is the debt service savings in the future because the state no longer would incur the debt service payment. And then finally, repealing the stadium reserve lets the stadium reserve balance fall to the bottom line. So in fiscal 23, you can see that $366 million from the stadium reserve would go towards paying the bond payment. So a net general fund cost in that year would be about $27 million to pay for the fence plus the additional general fund cost to pay off the bonds in total. Before we continue, Mr. Dahl, Senator Champion. 
And uh, just so that we're clear, the governor's uh, recommendation does not forgive the $150 million construction cost for the city of Minneapolis. Where there was the confusion is, from my vantage point, and they can always correct me if I'm wrong, is that they said if they were to uh, pay off, if they were to forgive the city's construction <coughs> obligation, it would cost the state $12.8 million each year through 2046. What you also should understand is that if the city's obligation continues at the 4.2% uh, interest rate over the, the maturity or the life of, this, of these bonds until it reach, reaches maturity, the city will pay on construction costs more than $333 million. That does not include the aggregated cost for operating and maintenance costs, because that's a separate line, and it does not include the excess growth allocation that is sometimes buried in this conversation. If there is growth, if there is growth, then there's a different allocation that happens, where the city of Minneapolis is now paying double when you think in terms of what potentially could be given to the Minnesota sports facilities authority, right? Because you not only have the obligate, uh, the, the operating maintenance cost they have to contribute to already, this already defined, but now you have this additional uh, um, excess allocation growth. That's what I understand. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. Mr. Chair, Senator, I believe you walked through it correctly. I'm just saying. <laughs> Senator Dreheim. I don't know if we have time to correct all the wrongs that Champion has, but uh, just kidding. Um, my question has to do with the payoff and the timing of it. So you, we have an ob opportunity to pay off the bond from what time frame? Uh, Mr. Chair, okay? Senator, um, it's typical for state bonds to have a shot at the 10-year mark to refinance the debt. It does not require us to refinance on June 1st this year or pay it off on that exact date. That's just when the window of opportunity opens where we can refinance the debt or pay it off. Follow-up, Chair? Senator Jam. So do we have a 30-day window, 90-day window? What, what is that window? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, it, there is no end date to the window, but the longer we wait to pay it off or refinance, we continue to pay interest at the higher original rate, so there is an ongoing interest cost. Thank you. Senator Champion, then Senator Westrom, then Senator Murphy. One last question before I leave. I'm going to be out of your hair, believe it or not. <laughs> it is also my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that in the uh, stadium uh, statute or the way the financing happens, there's the electronic pool tabs and the charitable uh, 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 revenue that is used to pay or to finance these bonds. What happens to that funding mechanism if these bonds are paid off, only the state's bonds, by the way, if, uh, if, uh, if the state's bonds are paid off? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, that funding mechanism, if the law weren't changed, that those excess dollars would continue to accrue to the stadium reserve but without the, law, the debt service payment. But if the law isn't changed, what would be the impact of not changing the law and what would happen with that funding source or to that funding source? Mr. Chair, Senator, to be clear, with no change to the law, but the Commissioner of Management and Budget uses authority under the Stadium Reserve statute to pay off the bonds. The gambling revenues that are currently being allocated towards the Stadium Reserve formula would continue to be allocated towards the Stadium Reserve formula. However, this, there would no longer be a debt service payment, so more money than under current law would accrue to the Stadium Reserve. So, and, and Senator Champion, just one clarification. There's one set of bonds, not two sets of bonds, not a city bond and a state bond. It's one set of bonds, but both sides were paying into it. Um, thank you. And we have a couple others, Senator Westrom and Senator Murphy. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you. Um, 
couple of questions. Uh, first of all, with interest rates that we locked in 10 years ago at 4.25 percent, what would a similar interest rate be going for today? And before you answer the question, uh, would it make does it make sense to pay the bonds off today, or is that cash got more value to us uh, not committing to higher interest debt now and leaving the low interest debt uh, payments in place and use the cash for something else? Uh, but tell me what the interest rates would be if we paid this off today and then redid the same thing. What, what would we be paying for that interest rate, and what, what's the state paying on other current bond, uh, debt bond interest rates right now, given uh, interest rates have not quite doubled, but probably close uh, since, since these were uh, put in place? The next sure. follow-up. Commissioner Hasmer. Sure. Mr. Chair, Senator, um, if we refinanced the debt and did not repay it this year, we would expect to be able to achieve interest rate savings if we did a full refinancing. Um, interest rates have been volatile over the last year. They've moved up and down quite a bit. Uh, by comparison, our general obligation bond sale last summer, we had interest rates just shy of 3%. Um, of course, general obligation bonds generally have a lower interest cost than the state appropriation bonds that we sold for the stadium. Um, we would be subject to market conditions were we to refinance later this summer, but I, at, based on current market trends, I would expect the interest rate to be below the 4.25%. So, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, what, we're, what you're saying is we'd be looking at refinancing either way we, we could either pay cash and, and just get rid of the debt, or else you'd refinance it because you now can do a GO bond and be f at the time of the building and construction, uh, we were not able to do GO bonds and we had to do appropriation bonds because of the revenue stream. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, if we refinance, we would still be issuing state appropriation bonds um, for that. Um, what was the second part but, of your question so, again? Okay, so how? So I guess to that point, uh, Mr. Chair, um, why did you bring up GO bonds then? If you're going to be refinancing uh, with appropriation bonds, and why, why would you have to do appropriation bonds and, so, and so not Western, I think put it in the you GO? You can't do GO bonds for this type of project. I think that her reason for mentioning it was just I had the same question: How much would GO bonds be? Just as a point of reference, but um, you can't, you couldn't use GO bonds for this. And, and what's the reason we can't do the GO bonds on this again? I thought it was always the revenue stream. We didn't we didn't commit the state taxpayers uh, or the state, um, what do they call it, the good faith and credit of the state. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, Senator Mr. Senator Mr. Nauman maybe has an answer. Um, the uh, the legislated, legislation that authorized this was for appropriation bonds. So you would need GO authorization from the legislature in order to authorize bonds that are GO. And Mr. Nauman, could you refinance with GO bonds using the using the stadium as still collateral for those general obligation bonds, or or would you not be using collateral? You'd just be using the. Uh, good, so, the Mr. Chair, the, the, Senator Westrom, yep. in order for the state to issue general obligation bonds, there has to be an authorization for those bonds from the legislature. In other words, the legislature has to pass with the higher legislative threshold mm -hmm. for for a GO obligation. In this particular case, for the financing of the stadium, there has been an authorization for appropriation bonds. And I think, unless I'm getting this wrong, Ms. Hasmer will correct me, that that's, that's what would have to be refinanced in that circumstance. Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Also, using GO bonds, it has to be a public entity. That's the owner. So the city or the state, unless the stadium was somehow considered um, owned by a public entity, which I'm not sure. It, and it is by the public finance. It is the stadium financing authority is a public. Is a public thing. entity. Okay. So, so, Mr. Chair, so kind of back. I guess I maybe opened up more of a can of worms than I thought I was opening. But uh, so, I, I guess maybe back to the question of refinancing. Um, are appropriation bonds at the same 4.25 percent interest now as they as they were when they sold the original? even with the higher interest rates that we've seen in the last year? 
Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, we would expect interest rates below that later this year. I can't predict what it would be were we to refinance, um, but there, there would likely be some savings um, absent the use of the stadium reserve to pay it off. And, and, and Mr. Chair, and so, so explain why that would be, because I'm, I'm having a disconnect, because we know the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates multiple points, uh, seven, eight times in, in the last nine, ten months. That usually drives the rate of return you have to get. How could, how would investors invest in these at a lower interest rate now when they could go to other things in the market and get higher interest rates to return? Or is it that it's established and it looks to be a much safer investment right now? Or can, can you just explain that a little bit more? And then I've got to follow up. Sure. Mr. Chair, Senator, it's true that municipal bond interest rates tend to follow the Federal Reserve action, but they don't march in lockstep. So there is a separate market that investors are, you know, setting the price that they're willing to pay for municipal bonds. And it remains a fairly active market, even in today's, in today's economic situation. Um, so there are plenty of investors out there that are competing and would compete for the state's bonds were we to reissue them or refinance them. Okay, and, Wilson, and then uh, to the governor's proposal, um, can you restate uh, or, or clarify that? You, you talked about the, from 2016 to 2020, the two, two point some million dollars of, a, of an annual payment. Is that basically the state's or the city's interest payment or that you're proposing to forgive? Uh, but you're not proposing to forgive the whole 12.8 million a year. You're just proposing to give about two, two, two point some million a year. Uh, can you explain that a little bit further? And uh, one more follow up then. Sure, Mr. Dahl. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator, um, I've, I've moved the slides to slide seven. Um, this is a view of the city's obligation annually for the stadium itself. On this slide, we show the city's construction obligation of $12.8 million. And then um, moving down to the next nine, the city's payback for advances the state made for capital and operating reserve from 2016 through 20, which was when this, it was before the city had a revenue source available to make payments. So the state negotiated a repayment schedule for that capital and operating reserve payments during that year for the city to pay back between 2021 through 2046 the payments that were made for, on the city's behalf during that time. So the annual payment to pay back that advance is two and a half million dollars per year and that's the portion that the governor is proposing to forgive. And, and so Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Dahl, what, what's the reason we're proposing to forgive that um, at all? I mean, the city has the revenue stream. The reason we stepped up and borrowed them the money or, or prepaid it for them was because they didn't have the convention center offline yet and they needed to wait, and then that was going to be the revenue stream, if I'm recalling right. Uh, what, what's the reason we're proposing to pay it back? Just, just a gift? or is there some other basis behind it? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, I can't speak to the, the governor's reasoning behind all of the proposals. What I can say is forgiving this would bring some relief to the city. Anything uh, Mr. Chair, um, Mr. Dahl, in, in essence, it would just be a gift of money. I mean, that's, they just would be relieved of debt. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, this would relieve this repayment stream. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that clarification. Appreciate it. Senator Murphy is next. Senator is, Muhammad, is this on that point? Or? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, just so I understand it correctly, paying it off soon would pay off, would, really, would give a relief to the state's taxpayers, but not the city of Minneapolis taxpayers, would still be on the hook for this, correct? Uh, Assistant Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Senator, um, presuming you're talking about the debt financing for the stadium to pay for the construction costs, um, it would save all state taxpayers um, those, uh, those additional interest costs for the following 20 years. Okay. And then a follow-up, Mr. Go Chair. ahead. So 
if the state is proposing or the governor is proposing that we pay off the construction costs for the state through the bonds, why is the city still on the hook? I'm still not, I'm, I'm still having a hard time grappling with a construction cost that's being paid off. And I know there's like, I'm still having a hard time trying to understand that. As a, a confusion. Minneapolis resident. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Senator, I understand the confusion. It's, it's a complicated law to understand. Um, it's really two separate prov provisions in the law that are at play here. Um, one is that the state uh, financed the full public share of construction costs on behalf of the city as well back in 2014. But the separate provision in state law also requires the city to pay $150 million towards the construction costs of the stadium. So they are actually independent provisions in law. So even if the state takes out the debt financing, there are still state resources being used to pay the obligation that still exists in current law for the city. Senator Muhammad, do you follow up on that or no? Um, Maybe not a question, maybe a comment. Uh, just from like talking to people from both the city and sort of the state, my understanding is the city is is on the hook for the construction debt still, right? Part of that. And then like other ongoing fees. And to my understanding, by the time it gets to 2046, the city is going to be on the hook for a billion dollars. And there's like maybe we like need to have a conversation about how to figure it all out. But I'm having a hard time understanding how we can get to a point where we can pay for the state's debt and leave the city, the city's taxpayers on the hook. I just find that to be very unfair. Uh, on this, we have, uh, I'm not sure if answer to that or nothing, but I'm hearing um, Senator Dames and Senator Pappas, but um, Mr. Dog, did you have any comments on that? Or? Um, Mr. Chair, just just one one point of clarification. This, this under the assumptions um, that built this slide, the middle column aggregate costs through fiscal forty seven. It does show the city total aggregate costs at eight hundred and fifty five million. Um, that's all. Senator, Mr. Chair. Mr. Nauman, go ahead. I don't want to get in the middle of this, but I want to return to something that Mr. Dahlm pointed out before, that the excess growth allocation calculation that generates as this chart displays $123 million is based on an assumption about sales tax growth over time. And different minds making different assumptions could end up at different conclusions of what that total is. And so I think to Senator Muhammad's point, I think the number that she is referencing depends on a different analysis, most centrally on that particular excess growth calculation. It may be material to the conversation, it may not, because what we do know is that it's probably not 123 million, it's probably something else, but it's dependent upon what you assume the future growth in sales tax will be. And if you can tell me what that is, please let me know, because I've got a few bets to make. <laughs> Um, Chair. Sir Muhammad. You know, maybe uh, maybe this is uh, not the right thing to do, but I would propose the city to maybe come and, and give us the same kind of um, presentation that the state did. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair and um, Senator Muhammad, I've had some conversations with the city. They were quite helpful in a conversation that I had with them on Friday. And centrally to this point, I think their analysis depends on a slightly higher rate of sales tax, tax growth. I have asked their analysts to unwind that growth and replicate the same growth assumption that, that MMB was making at the time that I was looking at MMB's analysis. And they ended up roughly within a million dollars or so over the, over, the, over the time period. So I think they're analyzing it the same way. The city can speak to this point if, if, I, if I'm speaking incorrectly. I think they're observing the law the same way. It's just a question of how much assumed growth in sales tax you have through 2046. So I don't think they're misunderstanding the calculation itself. I'm seeing nods from the city in the back. So I think that's a fair characterization. So um, Senator Dame, I'm not forgetting you, Senator Murphy, because you you were an expert. If it's on this stream we've been talking about, Senator Dames. Yes, it is. And I think we want to go back in history a little bit. When this stadium was built, there were several cities that were looking at hosting the building of this stadium. The reasons they were doing that is because of the economic impact it was going to have 
to their city. So these were agreements that the city of Minneapolis made with the state of Minnesota, and they ended up being the ones that received the, the stadium. The first five years, these, some of these payments were made by the state with an agreement with the city that they would pay them back over future years. This was all agreed to, no different than when you go buy a car or buy a house, you agree to pay it back. These were agreements that were made to be, that were made, and were, or should these obligations do continue. Now the fact that the state of Minnesota is thinking about paying back the stadium should not alter what the, state of Mini, or what the city of Minneapolis owns. They're the ones that have received the economic impact. Now I know that somebody's gonna jump up and say, now wait a minute, Senator Dames, the state received a lot of economic impact too. That is correct. However, keep in mind that the state would receive that economic impact if it was built in Minneapolis, St. Paul, or some of the other places that were looking at it. So this economic impact was one of the biggest reasons that the city of Minneapolis was willing to do this. And so therefore, uh, keep that in mind when you start wondering why they're asked to pay it back like there's something shameful here, keep in mind that the receipt of this on their part is the economic impact for several years. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and thank you, Assistant Commissioner Hassemer, for being here. We recognize you had to go by now. Um, we'll continue, before we get back to the presentation, Senator Murphy had, had her hand up, and it looks like Senator Pappas does as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I knew I was gonna love being on this committee. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was right about that. Um, I, I appreciate this presentation and uh, have been listening carefully to the variety of perspectives um, about this important issue that's before us. Um, and I, I think I understood this from you, Mr. Dahl, but I just wanna make clear for myself, as we think about the, the conditions of the deal that was struck back in 2012 and everything that's happened in between and the the governor's proposal to pay off the bonds and as I've heard said, get the state out of the stadium business. Is, is there anything that the legislature needs to authorize for the administration to take that next step of paying off the bonds? Mr. Dell. Mr. Chair, Senator, I'm gonna move the slides to the picture of the current stadium reserve. Under current law authority, the commissioner of MMB, after consultation with the Legislative Commission on Planning on and Fiscal Policy. Fiscal Policy, thank you. Um, the commissioner of management budget may use the uh, resources in the stadium reserve for either refinancing or payoff. The projected balance at the end of the current fiscal year is $366 million whereas the payoff is $377 million. So the reserve balance would not be quite enough at that time to make a full payoff. However, within several months of the end of this current fiscal year, the balance would grow to likely grow under the current forecast to a size large enough for a full payoff. One further point, if the commissioner did that with no law change, any balance in the stadium reserve would continue remaining in the stadium reserve and the current law formula would remain in place, meaning excess revenues under lawful gaming would continue to accrue to the stadium reserve itself, not to the general fund bottom line. So, and so Mr. In effect, a month or two later, they could do it without, they could pay it off without legislative action. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so Mr. Chair and Mr. Dahl, um, if we get to the uh, end of the session and we've not taken action on anything, on any of this, and then the, the bucket that you need um, fills up and you consult with the Legislative Commission on Fiscal Policy, then could MMB pay off the bonds? Mr. Chair, Senator, yes, Ms. MMB could pay off the bonds at that point. I can't speak to what the bond markets will be at that time. Um, certainly we would do a financial analysis and make a prudent decision based on those that scenario. And then Mr. Time. Chair, just one follow up, just so I'm clear, um, because there are a lot of interactions here. The balance of what we've been discussing here, any action on the balance of this would require change in the law um, to talk about Minneapolis and its obligations, to talk about the stadium reserve fund, 
um, all of that requires action on the part of the legislature um, to take a next step on what we've seen here today in your presentation. Mr. Chair, Senator, that's correct. The obligations under the current law under recapture of city revenue um, and the um, financing, or I'm sorry, the fiscal structure of the stadium reserve itself would remain in place. Thank you. Before you finish the presentation, Senator Pappas. Yes. Uh, um, sorry, we keep interrupting you finishing the presentation. Um, I just want to clarify because we've been talking about kind of all taxpayers and just to confirm that the state share of the stadium is being paid from lawful gambling revenue. So really it's gamblers that are paying for the state. Now, I think you would say, where would that money go otherwise if it wasn't going into the stadium reserve fund? And assuming it would go into the general fund, you know, that would be probably a positive thing for the general fund. Um, and then the city is using a hospitality sales tax, not a general sales tax to pay for this. So people who are, who are visiting uh, Minneapolis or visiting their hotels, I don't know how far that extends, that hospitality sales tax. The Minneapolis people would have to speak to that. Um, but again, it's not a general sales tax. It's the hospitality sales tax, which is probably smart on their part to use that source of funding, but again, that money could go elsewhere if it wasn't being used to pay off this debt. Um, and then I had a last comment about the funding, which I've now forgotten, but I think that's enough for now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Yell, I guess you can continue and complete the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, in, unless I missed something, I believe um, I was about to wrap up with just the kind of the bottom line of this slide, which um, takes into account the governor's recommendation, again, to pay off the bonds, fund the first phase of a uh, secure perimeter around the stadium itself, forgive the Minneapolis loan repayment for capital and operating reserve, and then the next line, debt service savings, would be the savings that would accrue to the state from no longer making debt service payments and then repealing the stadium reserve and letting those dollars fall to the bottom line of the general fund. The net fiscal impact of those actions would result in a cost to the state in fiscal year 23 of $27 million. And then after that, that growth in the stadium reserve along with savings from debt service would accrue to the bottom line of the general fund. So from fiscal year 23 through 25, that middle column on the bottom line, the bolded number, the savings under the governor's proposal to the general fund would be about $341 million. And then out in the tails in 26-27, the savings under the governor's proposal to the general fund would be about $400 million. And when Senator Pappas, um, Mr. Nauman points out, you're correct that the, the hospitality tax would not be with the general sales tax, it's on, on lodging, liquor, restaurants, et cetera. So lodging, liquor, said, restaurants. So Mr. Chairman, I, I don't know if anyone knows the answer to this. And Minneapolis is also paying operating costs for the stadium. And so I was wondering where the source of funding was for that, if it's also the hospitality sales tax um, or um, their property taxes. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, all of the city's contributions for the stadium, all of their obligations are funded via those hospitality tax revenues. And um, with this, um, and so again, the biggest savings are in the, in the governor's numbers, he's taking the, repealing the stadium reserve, putting it in the general fund, which is 160 million a year roughly, um, growing. Um, is there any other questions from the committee or discussion from the committee? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I know I got to the hearing a little bit late, um, but just to follow up on Senator Pappas's question, um, if the sales, the stadium reserve fund is able to backstop Minneapolis if sales tax receipts for operating and, and ongoing maintenance were to fall short, is that correct? Mr. Chair, Senator, yes, that's correct. However, the state collects in the first place, city sales tax revenue, so they would have to fall significantly short of um, current projections. I think um, off the top of my head, this revenue source was projected to be about $70 million per year. 
whereas the city's obligations are about $25 million per year under this um, law. Thank you. Senator Mohammed. Um, the, the question that Senator Peppers asked and how the city's paying for the capital costs, I think that was wrong, not to correct you, but I think the city's paying for it through entertainment, restaurants, laundry, but the city's here, so maybe they can answer how, what, how that's happening. Mr. Nauman, do you have? <clears throat> Mr. Chair and Senator Mohammed, I had a conversation with the city on Friday, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the information they provided was it was lodging, restaurant, and the, the, the suite of liquor taxes, but did not include entertainment. Am I incorrect in that? Yeah, apparently I am incorrect in that. We want to have briefly, we, would, we want to wrap this up quickly, but maybe somebody from the city of Minneapolis come up and explain that. Welcome to the committee and please identify yourself for the record. Uh, good morning, Chair Marty and committee. I'm Angie Skildum. I'm the Development Finance Director for the City of Minneapolis. And just to clarify this point, the state is retaining local city um, taxes for the purposes of the stadium that include state uh, citywide lodging, citywide general sales, and then downtown uh, restaurant and downtown liquor. So the uh, citywide entertainment is excluded, but the uh, general citywide sales tax is included. Could I, can I ask you on that one? Because I, I think you just said citywide general sales tax. That's also part of it? Yes, uh, Senator, that's correct. So hardware C the store. Citywide sales tax. Yes. Okay, everything there, but I'm not entirely clear, and I'm not sure if others are feeling this way too, but which things are funded by the, what you might call the hospitality tax, or whatever, which are funded by the general city sales tax? Uh, Senator Marty, um, there's no such defined thing as a hospitality tax. Okay. I think that that's just kind of a right. language that's being used to categorize this suite of, of special city of Minneapolis taxes, of which we have five four of which contribute to the stadium repayment. The one that is excluded is the citywide entertainment tax. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Pratt, did you have a follow-up to that here? I see. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a, a brief, a couple of brief questions on this because it's I'm still trying to wrap my arms around it. Um, so when the stadium was passed, you were allowed to add an, a, an excess local impact tax to your, to your sales tax, but I just want to make sure I under so, so you have you were granted the ability to charge excess sales tax to c help cover this the stadium. It's not coming out of your general seven percent or whatever it is. Um, and then when when we're talking general sales tax, we're talking citywide on a pack of gum, um, not just in the downtown district, right? Uh, Senator Pratt, Senator Marty. Um, the first question I'm not certain that I can answer. I was not at the city at that time, but my understanding um, is that there were not extra taxes that were granted to the city. Those special taxes already existed in Minneapolis through state authority, and they are at the same level that they were at that time. Eric may know differently. To your second question, yes, it is just the citywide general sales tax. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so I guess I was thinking more along the lines of the twins, the convention center, those types of taxes that we had provided in excess above normal sales taxes was what I was trying to get at. But maybe no special provision for the Viking Stadium, just a continuation. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Um, I wanted to mention, not really the stadium, but Senator Dreheim, your point for the Incorrect reference at Senate, at Senate index. They've already corrected that on their web page. Back to this. Any last <laughs> Senator Western. Mr. Chair, just a final um, to the testifier. She can confirm, or, or Mr. Nauman, or you, Mr. Chair. But um, the the tax that's being targeted to pay these uh, costs off for the Viking Stadium, as I recall, was what. Minneapolis had been able to put in place for paying off the renovations or a share of the renovations of the of the Minneapolis Convention Center 
um, and, the, and they were supposed to sunset or expire and the legislature just let them continue them on. Is, am I remembering that correctly or mostly correctly? Senator Scooter. Lindstrom, Senator Marty, uh, yes, I believe that is correct. Any foe, if not, uh, it's Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Dahl. If that's the case, that this was a special tax that was used for renovating the convention center, and then when that ran out, they just kept that tax going and used it for the stadium. If the stadium is paid off and we do not, and, and the city does not pay that $2.5 million, uh, and the stadium is paid off, is that tax going to go off? Because the project that they've used to pay, to pay it is, is now paid off. And if we're going to relieve some of the debt, would that not relieve the tax? Senator Dames, I, I, I think that I don't know that there's a proposal out there that would be paying it off. Pay, the state would be paying off the bonds. Minneapolis, as, as Mr. Dahl said, the governor's proposal would continue having them pay the state with that revenue. Uh, Mr. Chair, there's a, the governor's uh, budget calls for a $2.5 million per year uh, that would not be paid by the city of Minneapolis. So it's partially being paid off by the state. And my question is, was that change that tax any with that being paid off and the process being paid off? Does somebody know what, when does the sales tax sunset when the city's obligations on this are paid off? Uh, Mr. Chair, to answer the question, the governor's proposal forgives the advances that the state made for operating and capital reserve in, um, from 2016 through 20 at a cost of $2.5 million per year. However, the governor's proposal does not forgive repayment of the city's obligation for construction of the stadium. And I think the second part of the question was whether the sales taxes themselves turn off when obligations are complete, and I believe the answer to that is no. Okay. Okay. Um, Senator Pratt, last question or well, comment? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I guess I'm confused by that answer because I'm looking on page 15. It looks like... The governor's proposal is to forgive future payments to the to the tune of uh, ten million dollars or uh, over the next two biennia. Um, so I guess I I thought, as I understood the governor's proposal, he was still requiring Minneapolis to pay the back repay the state for the back uh, or or for the uh, for the payments that were that were made on their behalf. By the state, and then forgiving the the out years, and that's what I was reading in this. Am I, am I misinterpreting slide fifteen? I think it's backwards. I think he's paying off the he's forgiving them the back part, and not the future. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm trying to understand. Twelve twelve point five or twelve point eight per year, the state would continue to receive, but the stuff we fronted for them up front for the last few years would not be. Mr. Dell. Mr. Chair, Senator, perhaps, perhaps the slide seven, which is on the screen right now, would help um, answer that question. The governor's proposal would keep in place the line labeled construction, which is the city's obligation for construction of the stadium. The governor's proposal would forgive the payback of the 16 through 20 advances, which is two and a half million dollars per year. But then the remainder of the city's payments, the operating and capital reserve and an excess growth allocation would remain in place. So under current law, the city's obligation is about $26.7 million next fiscal year. And under the governor's proposal, the city would be responsible for about $24.2 million. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, can you help me understand then why the governor is stretching out his, it, why, why the governor is suggesting that we stretch this out over a, this forgiveness over four years rather than if, if it truly is uh, back payments, um, why not just pay it off with Senator, the part of the $17.5 billion surplus? Senator Pratt, they are, he is forgiving. It just shows that it was, they were paying us $2.5 million a year for the next 20 years or so. It's a total of Roughly 60 million, okay. but but it's it's not a thing we're paying off. 
It's just they're not going to keep paying that two and a half million per year. That's why it shows up year after year. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I was reading slide 15 incorrectly. Is there anything else? If not, we're going to this committee. Well, let me first say that Senator Murphy's committee and this committee will be seeing more of stadium stuff as in getting more information as, it, as the session continues. Um, with no further business, this committee is, uh, well, for next week, we're still working on next week's agenda, and we will get back to members as soon as we can. And thank you to MMB and City of Minneapolis for presentation.